Welcome to Spooky Ass Shit. This is a remix episode, so this is 2020 COVID quarantine, Eric speaking to you, but I'm going to be tossing it back to the younger, healthier, I don't know if I was happier or not, but we'll see, uh, 2016, Eric, going back all the way to episode number 10, and interestingly, perhaps, this was the first episode that I ever did all by myself, no guest co-host. I always wanted to have a guest co-host, and I still prefer to have a guest co-host when I can, but sometimes, uh, schedule-wise, it just doesn't line up. But this was the very first time that happened, and I invited everyone to let me know what you thought of the show with just me as your host, no co-host, and uh, I still invite you to do that. Let me know what you like better. Do you like it fine when I'm by myself? Or do you like it better when I have a guest co-host? Now, in this episode, I'm talking about vampires in America, vampires in New England specifically, but vampires in America. And I think, uh, let's see, an interesting update since then is that since that time, I have actually been to the grave of Mercy Brown, the Rhode Island Exeter vampire. And uh, that was kind of interesting because it was with a certain young lady and it was early on in our dating career and uh it was just something we were driving back from somewhere else i forget where we had gone but we we had gone southernly for some reason and we were driving back towards rhode island and i said hey there's a, a vampire grave i'd like to check out if you don't mind and uh she had shown some slight interest in spooky stuff in the past so i felt comfortable asking this this young lady uh, to make a, an, a rather odd detour like this, and she was down for it. So we went. Uh, it's a very pleasant little cemetery, and it is little. It's right next to a little church, um, and you can tell which grave is hers because it's the one with people taking pictures at it, but also there's kind of a lock around it, and it's right next to a tree. And, uh, you know, nothing too exciting to see there or anything, but kind of a cool little roadside place you can visit, not too hard to find, right there in Exeter, Rhode Island. I'll post a picture of that on the Instagram when this episode is up. And uh, otherwise, I don't have too much more to say about it. Just go ahead and check out this episode from, I think this was April of 2016. Oh, and by the way, you're going to hear me talk about rehearsals and stuff every once in a while. I cut out a lot of that segment because I was talking about the production of hair that I was going into at that time. Obviously, that's old news now, so there's no show to talk about, no reason to hype it up, so I cut that stuff out, but I still reference rehearsal once in a while. I might even mention hair towards the end, but that's what I was talking about. All right, on with the show. Welcome to Spooky Ass Shit. I am your host, Eric Dwinnells, and my guest co-host tonight is nobody. I'm sitting here by myself in the living room studio, and the reason for that is uh, basically twofold. One, I'm a busy motherfucker, and so are my guests, my rotation of guests. So it's very hard to find people that are available during the, oh, hour and a half that I have between work and rehearsal, but I'm trying to fit in this episode to do that, and I don't want to cheat you guys of an episode, so I'm going to do this one solo. But please, drop me a line at Gmail. Uh, The address is spookyassshit at gmail.com, and let me know what you think of this episode, where it's just me doing it myself. Either let me know, yeah, that's okay, go ahead and do that sometimes if you need to, Or say, hey, you know what? You were really lame and boring, and I don't want to hear that again. So please, always make sure you have a guest co-host to keep things interesting. I'll take it as constructive criticism. Don't worry. I can handle it. So speaking of the email, we also have the website, spookyassshit.com or spookyas.com, if you're a prudish iTunes type. You can also find us on Instagram, at spookyassshit, and on Twitter, at spookyassshit. Now, today we're going to talk about uh, vampires in New England. Relatively early New England, I guess you'd say. I was just going to do an episode about vampires in America, because I didn't think I'd find enough interesting stuff about New England vampires. But I think, actually, I found a good amount. So we're going to talk about uh, what they referred to as the New England vampire panic. 
we'll save the more modern time American vampires for another show. It's not as fun because they're basically just murderers who thought they were vampires. It's still interesting, but it's not going to be like, you know, it's not a fun episode. It's about murder. This one, I don't know if this could be described as fun, but it's a little bit more light than that. Okay, already rambling to myself. It feels really weird doing this alone. Not going to lie to you. A couple housekeeping things. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in the show Hair right now, and we had a rehearsal that I want to tell you guys about because you're involved. We had a rehearsal where we all got together um, with some people from an improv studio to, uh, you know, do some kind of... Every hair cast is called a tribe, so they wanted us to bond and learn how to, you know, play with each other in a theatrical context. So we had some improv people come in and basically give a master class for three hours on improv. And it was in the early afternoon, and I had spent that whole morning editing an episode of Spooky Ass Shit. I think it was the one about backmasking. Um, so the paranormal and the occult and all that stuff is never too far from my mind anyway, but especially as I walked into this rehearsal, it was right on the tip of my tongue because I had just spent a couple hours, you know, recording and editing and all that stuff. And the rule in improv is you're not allowed to make anything up ahead of time, right? You just have to yes and, and you have to go with the first thing that comes to your head. Well, because I'd been editing this stuff all morning, the first thing that came to my head was always spooky ass shit. So I said something about the devil and then something about skulls or something. And I said, you know what? Hair is a show about the peace and love generation and everything and the peace movement of the 60s. Maybe uh, I'm going to look like a bit of a freak if I keep talking about death and demons and occult and ghosts and all that stuff. Um, and also, so I said, I, you know, I want to show people that there's more to me than this and I got to get this out of my head, right? Which is what you're not supposed to do in improv, but what was I going to do? Just keep talking about the stuff I'd been talking about and look like a serial killer in front of everybody? So then we're playing this game where you're supposed to like, Imagine you're getting a gift from the person in front of you in a circle, or next to you in a circle, I guess. And the person gives you the imaginary gift, and then you open it, and you determine what the gift is, but you have to act like you love it uh, and explain why it's such a good gift. So the person before me had said, oh, it's a glass pineapple. How nice. Blah, 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 blah. So then it comes to me, and I'm thinking, don't say something spooky. Don't say something spooky. Don't say something spooky. And it gets to me, and that's the thought I have in my head, and the only thing I can think of, the first thing that comes to my mind, which is what you're supposed to go with, is glass pineapple. But I can't say that, because that's the only reason it's at the top of my head is because someone else just said it. So now i got to think of something else to say, right? So I put my hand in, but I put my hand in as if I was picking up a glass pineapple. But I said, oh, I can't say that. I can't say glass pineapple. So just... Just replace those words. Just replace those words. So not glass, not glass, but uh, crystal, crystal. And not a pineapple, but uh, crystal skull. Ah, fuck, I did it again. Another occultic, spooky symbol that I plucked out of the air. After that, we did another improv where we were supposed to be things in a hotel. And I was just pretending to be an old man complaining to the the, uh, concierge. But guess what? Then the concierge starts talking about ghosts. And I have to improv off that. So now I've brought up the devil. I've brought up crystal skulls. Now I'm talking about ghosts. Everyone here thinks I'm a freak, right? They have to by now. So now I decide I am going to just... I'm, I know it's against the rules, but I'm going to think of things ahead of time. And I'm just going to talk about happy things. So for the rest of the day, I talked about flowers and puppies. So hopefully... That balanced it out. Although that might make it worse. I don't know. I don't know. Are they going to start talking now about how first he was talking about the devil and skulls and and ghosts, and now he's talking about flowers and puppies? I don't know what's worse. How about we get into the proper subject of today's show, which is vampires of New England. Mm. I made the hack noise because there was no guest here to do it. All right. 
So the first recorded reference, re- recorded reference to vampires in New England comes from Councilman Moses Holmes from the town of Wilmington, who wrote a letter that was published in the paper to beware of a certain quack doctor, a foreigner, who was going around urging families to dig up and burn dead relatives to stop a disease known as consumption. He had witnessed several children disinterred at the quack doctor's request and didn't want to see it happen over and over again. So that the bodies of the dead may rest quiet in their graves without such interruption, I think the public ought to be aware of being led away by such an imposter. So that tells you right there, as far back as 1784, people were uh, exhuming their body, the bodies of the dead family members. Now, consumption is a disease that we know today as tuberculosis. Um, But back in these days, it was a big killer in New England. I believe it killed uh, about a quarter of the population uh, in ye olden times. And even though they knew that it was a disease, they didn't quite know how it spread or what caused it exactly or how to treat it. They had no idea how to treat it. Um, And... It basically was a death sentence if you had it for most people. It was described as a disease which basically wasted you away. Like you could visibly see a person wasting away. Their eyes would sink in. They'd lose a lot of weight. They'd have very, very high fevers and um, cough up blood even. Like huge, huge fits of coughing. And they'd eventually start coughing up blood. Then we have our next, our first real reported incident of exhumation in 1817 frederick ransom who died of consumption in south woodstock vermont uh, his father was worried that he would come back and attack the rest of his family so he ordered his body to be exhumed and then as a crowd of hundreds from the town watched his heart was removed along with some other organs and burned on a blacksmith's anvil. Now, this case is especially unusual because uh, the Ransom family was actually a wealthy family, and Frederick Ransom himself had graduated from Dartmouth College. So he was an educated man who came from a good family, which is unusual in the uh, vampire panic because it was mostly found in rural farming communities with uneducated people. Then we move on to sometime in the 1830s. We don't have an exact date on this one, and I'll explain that in a minute. But in Griswold, Connecticut, a 50-something-year-old named simply J.B., as far as we know, was buried, but then five years later, someone apparently smashed into his, dug up and smashed into his coffin and reorganized his bones Jolly Roger style. So his arms were crossed, his head was uh, removed, his arms were removed and crossed over his chest, and his head was placed on top. Uh, His ribs were broken, most likely so that his heart could be taken out. Now we know this because his body was discovered uh, in the 1990s by a child at play. And it wasn't just his body, it was a a grave. They found a whole um, cemetery plot. That hadn't been known before. And they did some testing and they found out they found out this was when it's from. Now all the graves are normal, except for this grave in particular, which happened to belong to JB. Why do we say JB? Because that's what was inscribed on one of the coffin nails. Those two letters, JB. His was the only one that had any kind of sign of tampering. And the belief is because they thought he was a vampire. They didn't know at first why... There would be the sign of tampering until someone pointed out, hey, this grave is from the time of the New England vampire panic. And this is pretty typical of what people might have done to a suspected vampire. Moving on to 1854 in Jewett City, Connecticut, a number of exhumations took place due to townspeople fear of vampires. Again, consumption was running wild through the city. And so people were just digging up people and looking for signs of vampirism, and if they found it, they would remove the heart 
or decapitate the body or any number of things. We'll get into a little bit later describing exactly what some of the processes were, but the exhumations are recorded. Now we move on to the most famous of the New England vampires. 1892. And now we have Mercy Lena Brown. She's the most famous New England vampire, mostly because there was a reporter who witnessed and wrote about the exhumation of her body, and the story was picked up internationally as an example of the odd beliefs of backwoods Yankees. Mercy was from Exeter, Rhode Island, which was a rural farm town. Uh, it had about 2,000-something residents uh, about 50 years before these incidents took place. But then, thanks to the ravages of consumption and the Civil War, the town had shrunk down to just 961 residents. So there was a big fear of death in this town because basically it was a dying town. People were moving away. Uh, the Civil War had taken its toll. Consumption had taken its toll. So they didn't want to see families being wiped out by consumption. And when they did, that was a big cause of panic in those households. In 1882, consumption entered into the Brown household, with Mercy's mother being the first victim. In 1883, Mercy's 20-year-old 20 sister also died of consumption. About three years later, Mercy's brother Edwin also became sick. Now, he then moved to Colorado with the hopes that the change of climate would be good for his condition. That was a very popular belief. If you just got some fresh air, if you did some horseback riding, maybe this would help your consumption. That's where a lot of the hot springs treatments and all that kind of stuff comes from back in these days. Uh, people just thought a change of climate and some fresh air would do a person good. Soon after this, Mercy herself became sick. As she was dying, her brother Edwin returned from Colorado. The move did not improve his health, and he too was knocking on death's door. Mercy passed away in 1892. The town then became panicked and requested George Brown, who was Mercy's father, to exhume her, the remains of his wife and two daughters to check for signs of vampirism. Now, what were signs of vampirism? This could include little or no decomposition on the body, red cheeks, blood around the mouth, and blood in the heart. He reluctantly agrees to allow the exhumations, but does not attend them himself. He did not believe in the vampire theory, but he wanted to satisfy his neighbors. Having been interred for a decade, all that remained of Mercy's mother and sister were bones. Mercy's body, however, had just been interred a couple months ago, and before it was even buried in the ground, because it being New England, the ground freezes, so bodies are kept in a crypt before they are buried in the winter, uh, her body was basically frozen for a time after she died, and then buried. So her corpse looked pretty fresh when they dug it out of the ground looking pretty much as she did in life. A doctor was present, and he examined the lungs, heart, and liver. He found the telltale signs of consumption on the lungs, and only congealed blood in the heart. So not fresh blood, congealed blood. But the townsfolks insisted on burning the heart anyway. The ashes were mixed into a drink and given to her brother Edwin in the hopes that it would restore him to health. It didn't work and he died just two months later. Some believe that Mercy is the inspiration for a character in Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula. Lucy is a teenaged beauty who suddenly becomes ill with what appears to be consumption, though it is later revealed, of course, that she is a victim of the vampire Count Dracula. She, too, is exhumed with a medical doctor presiding over the ritual. Now, you can find Mercy Brown's grave in Exeter, Rhode Island to this day. In fact, it's a very popular tourist spot if you're into this kind of thing. I haven't been there myself, but I actually would like to go sometime. And there's a legend that no grass grows on her grave. And that actually turns out to be true. 
However, it's not because grass can't grow on a vampire's grave, which was the popular theory. It's actually just because so many people visit the grave that it's trampled, the grass is trampled upon, upon, so nothing can quite grow as luscious as the neighboring plots do. Over the years, not to change subjects from vampires to ghosts, but while we're talking about her, Mercy is said to haunt a bridge and often manifest as the smell of roses. It is said that she can be heard sometimes in the cemetery, and she is often reported on EVP recordings, electric voice phenomena, which we'll do a whole episode about. She is rumored to visit the terminally ill to let them know, hey, I know you're going to die, but guess what? It's not that bad. I went through it. No big deal. You can handle it. You'll make it. You'll be fine. So she sounds like basically kind of a sweet girl. So I'd go visit her grave, leave a flower or something. I guess people do leave trinkets there. And one of the articles I was reading, uh, unfortunately, it said people kept trying to steal her gravestone. Well, that kind of figures. They've put an iron uh, strap, I guess, over it now so you can't take it. But that doesn't stop assholes from carving their names in it. And if you do um, deface a grave, you are an asshole. Make no mistake. However, if you leave things, that's okay. Some people um, leave plastic vampire teeth. Some people leave flowers, of course. And uh, there was a report about someone leaving a heart-shaped pendant there. So she'd have a heart once again, I guess. Now, just to go back to talking about the vampire panic in general, as I stated earlier, it mostly took place in rural areas of New England, farm towns, with uneducated people. These were people that knew farm life, and maybe not a whole lot more. They knew what they had to know to survive. We know of at least 80 vampire-related exhumations in America during this time, but it is likely that the number is much higher, and the graves have just not been discovered yet. City folk found the rural people superstitious and mocked them openly in newspaper accounts of the anti-vampire rituals being carried out. One reporter writing for a small town Connecticut paper said, we seem to have been transported back to the darkest age of unreasoning ignorance and blind superstition instead of living in the 19th century and in this state calling itself enlightened and Christian. That's from a report from 1854 about some of the exhumations. Another report from the Boston Daily Globe said that perhaps the reason these backwoods New Englanders have such strange superstitions is because with the populations being so low, there's a certain amount of inbreeding that goes on. Thanks, city folk. That's a nice, polite way of putting it, isn't it? Now... When we talk about vampires, we need to talk about the difference between folklore vampires, which is what we're talking about here, and pop culture vampires. Because today, when we think of vampires, some of us may think of Count Dracula. And when I say think of Count Dracula, I don't even mean the Count Dracula that appears in Bram Stoker's novel. I mean... Uh, essentially the Bela Lugosi Universal Studios Dracula which is the image that most people would have in their head of Dracula even if they've never seen that movie because it's such an iconic image actually in the book Count Dracula is described as looking nothing like that but that's a whole nother subject Uh, also you might think of maybe Twilight the sparkly vampires that everyone takes a turn shitting on. Honestly, I've never seen the movies. I've never read the book. I don't have any opinion on it either way. And Interview with a Vampire or the Anne Rice Vampires, very homoerotic, very aristocratic. Those are kind of uh, pop culture, sexy vampires. But in folklore... A vampire is actually closer to what we might think of as a zombie. It's a reanimated corpse. 
that retains nothing of the humanity that it had in life. So it's not like your sister becomes a vampire and she comes back and you say, oh, hey, sis, what's going on? And she tricks you into thinking that she's back from the dead or whatever the ruse may be or that she's not a vampire. Um, she's going to look like a corpse. They're supposed to look scary and like corpses. Maybe not as exactly as fucked up as a zombie might look, but still enough that you know something was a little off, a little left of center with old sis. And it's not them controlling it. It's not the person who's controlling it. Uh, it depends on who you're asking, but most folklore would certainly ascribe it to some sort of evil power, whether they have a name for it or not. An evil presence, an evil power that has taken over the body of the dead. They only exist to feast on the living. The methods used to destroy the vampires varied from community to community. Sometimes family members would take part in exhumations, sometimes it was just townsfolk, and sometimes even doctors or clergymen were present. Most exhumations were done secretly, but some were done publicly and even celebrated by the town. In some communities, it was thought simply turning the corpse over in its grave would be enough. That way, if it tried to crawl out of the grave, it would actually be digging itself deeper into the dirt and not up and out of the grave. Other areas preferred to dismember the body and rearrange body parts so that the corpse couldn't put itself back together. Removing the heart was fairly common. The heart would be burned in some cases, and the ashes would be mixed into drinks, and serve to those who were ill in hopes that it would cure their illness. And we saw that with Mercy's brother Edwin. Didn't work for him, though. Because there's no such thing as vampires. So now that we've gone through the hysteria, let's talk about some reasons why it was able to catch on in the first place. Why was there this reason for fear? Well, first of all, we talked about consumption, which is known today as tuberculosis. We talked about the high fever, the sweating, coughing up blood, and wasting away. It was also easily spread through contact with those who were infected. At the time, they would have received the standard medical diagnosis of consumption, but there was little to be done to help anybody suffering from the disease or to stop the disease from spreading. So they knew they had this disease, but there was really nothing they could do. Like I said, they would maybe recommend some fresh air, some horseback riding, taking it easy, that kind of stuff. But scientifically, there weren't really any answers for these people. And when you're desperate and you want your loved one to live, you'll try to do anything, right? You'll leave no stone unturned in the effort to find a cure for this illness sweeping through your family taking family member after family member, being afraid that it's going to spread, not, out, not just in your home, but out into your surrounding community, getting your friends and your neighbors sick. So at this point, people turn to Native American and Slavic folklore for what we would call today alternative medicine. And then, just as it is now, when medical science can offer no more options, people turn to alternative medicine medicine. Now, of course, we could do a whole nother episode on alternative medicine, and maybe we will someday. The spookiest thing about that is that people actually believe in it. Now, I know that's going to be a bit of a downer for some of you. I'm sure everybody's got their own little things that they like to believe in, even though it doesn't make any rational sense, or it's not scientifically backed up. But the favorite saying about alternative medicine is that if it worked, it would just be called medicine, not alternative medicine. And I know, I know, conspiracies by big pharmaceutical companies keep out the cures and blah, 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 blah. I got to tell you guys, most of the time, trust science. If it's not going to cost you anything and you want to look into exploring other methods, Go for it. If someone's going to charge you a lot of money to start looking into something else, well, you might want to use some critical thinking. 
and really consider what you're paying for and go from there. Oftentimes, a family member would order a body exhumed to show that they were doing everything that they possibly could to prevent another death in the family and to protect their friends and neighbors from a similar fate. It was also a way to presumably relieve some guilt that you may have. This way, again, you can show that you were willing to try anything to get this to stop. You went to the doctor. That didn't work. You took some advice about fresh air and horseback riding. That didn't work. So now I'm going to go ask Indian John what to do. He says, look at the people who have died in the past. Try to find a corpse that is a little bit more fresh than the others, and destroy it? Okay, that's what I'll do. And by the way, the rural people at this time probably wouldn't have called this phenomena vampires. That's what the newspapers labeled it. I don't know, we don't have uh, any indication of what terms they would have used. But even though it sounds really irrational to think that this is how a disease could spread. Again, they're going to an extreme, but this is an extreme problem. And they didn't have any other any other answer. So to simply dismiss it as a superstitious act performed by fools is a big mistake. These were desperate people going to desperate measures. I mean, think about it. If someone came to you and said, hey, Your family, there seems to be an illness running through your family. If you dig up your dead mother and your dead sister and you burn their hearts and then eat a little bit of it, you might be able to cure your family. Are you going to agree to do that on a whim? Just out of foolishness? I don't think so. I don't think that's something you take lightly. Especially back in those days when people were even more superstitious than they are now because exhuming a body was a big deal think about the consequences that could have come from that hauntings and whatnot to stay in the paranormal realm and to to stay in reality if you choose to attend the ceremony you're seeing the corpse of a loved one after Presumably, it started some decomposition. Can't imagine that's a very pleasant experience, folks. It was also, these exhumations were also done as a show of good faith to the public. Again, uh, especially in George Brown's case, Mercy's father, he didn't believe in the whole vampire myth or conspiracy theory. He just said, I'm going to do this to satisfy the townsfolk. To show them, look, you're afraid one of my family members might be a vampire? Okay. I'm not going to take part, but go ahead. Dig them up. Have a doctor look at it. See what the real problem is. The doctor said it's consumption. It's not a vampire. It's consumption. The town still wasn't satisfied, so he said, okay, go ahead. Burn her heart. And then they had the brother drink it. Gross. But that turned out to be a good move on his part because um, George Brown actually lived until 1922. So he had about uh, 30 more years with these neighbors in town. So good idea for him to try to make nice with them. It's easy to laugh off the myths of the vampires. But you have to think in terms of people who didn't have the knowledge that we have today, the common knowledge. I mean, I'm not even talking about being a doctor and knowing exactly what happens to a body after someone decays, someone starts to decay. I'm just talking about, I mean, we all know that there's a process that happens, right? We all know what germs are. We all know what causes most diseases. There's a lot we don't know. But we know that there's people working on it, and someday, hopefully, we will know. At this time, there was a lot of question marks left in the air. So, all you could do was make your own observations. So, if you see that someone is dead, 
and then all of a sudden the corpse is bloated and it looks as if the person has recently eaten, you could mistake that as, hey, when I wasn't looking, maybe this person ate. Maybe this person got up and ate. Again, sounds crazy now, but put yourself back in the time frame. Put yourself in the mindset of these people who didn't have any kind of common knowledge about the process of death. What might what other things could they have thought? They have to you have to go from your own experience of the world. Unless you're a scientist or a doctor or someone who's thinking along those lines, you're not going to bring those types of thoughts to the table. You're going to bring the experience that you have from your lifetime. And so the experience that people have is when people look like they're getting heavier, it's because they ate. So this thing, this corpse, must have eaten. And I know it's maybe not my loved one come back to life because they didn't come up and say hello to me. They just got up and ate. So that must be an evil force. And hey, my sister got sick too. Right after this, maybe that corpse came back and attacked my sister and started to make her sick. Uh, there were also noises that dead bodies would make. This was the sound of gas and air escaping from the dead body. Uh, death rattles, these are known as. But again, if you don't know what the process is, you're judging by your own experience. When a person makes noise, it's because they are making noise. Not because it's some gas or something escaping from the body. I know, I know, farts, I get it. Funny joke. That's not what we're talking about here. And also there was some truth to the fact that illness does cause illness. So if you know one person who's sick and it's something that's contagious, it can spread to another person. Now again, we didn't have all the facts about germs at this time. But they really weren't on the wrong track. Illness can cause illness. And in that case, death can lead to death. That is the story of the New England Vampire Panic of the 16th, 18th, and even up to the 19th century. We made it through, you guys. What would you think? An Eric D. full episode. All by myself. Like I said, please feel free. Let me know what you thought of this episode. I don't plan on doing... Well, hopefully I don't... I don't. I mean, I don't think I'm going to... I don't plan on doing any more by myself. But you never know when little circumstances like this might pop up. I can't tell you how many people I asked to come on sometime during this week but it's just super super inconvenient hours for everybody including myself i'd rather be taking a nap right now resting up before rehearsal but such is my dedication to you dear listener from your humble narrator so anyway i hope you enjoyed this episode at least a little bit and hopefully next week i'll be back with a guest talking about some spooky ass shit but you never know. Maybe you'll just get me again. Because I got a weekend full of shows. And hey, listen, if you do happen to come see hair, if you're in the greater Boston area and you want to come see hair, stick around after the show because uh, we come out to the theater, you know, and say hello to our friends and fans and stuff. So stick around and uh, let me know that you listen to this episode. I should give you a code word. Um... I will just say New England Vampire, I guess. Just give me a wink and say New England Vampire. And I'll know that you're a podcast listener. And I will be so excited. It will make me very happy to know that someone actually took the time to listen to my solo first ever double digit episode of Spooky Ass Shit. This is episode number 10. I forgot. I don't know if it's that much to celebrate for a brand new podcast, but... We are now in the double digits, so congratulations to me. Why, thank you, Eric. That's so sweet of you. I always knew 
you could do it if you just persevered and and you're doing it you're living the dream i appreciate eric thank you so much and thank you listeners for listening don't forget to go to the website, SpookyAS.com, where you can find pictures to go along with this episode and every other episode of Spooky Ass Shit. And sometimes videos, too, by the way. The backmasking one has everything, all the tracks that we listen to on YouTube and the ones that I made myself. So you can go and listen to hidden satanic messages and rock music. There's pictures from John Stones on the John Stones episode. By the way, update on that. I did go to John Stones and asked to see the dress. They told me they do have the dress, but that it's out getting framed right now. Can you believe that? I thought the dress wasn't supposed to leave the restaurant or some spooky ass shit would start to happen to whoever took the dress out. I guess we'll have to wait and get the full report on that. For more about John Stones in, go back to episode number three of spooky ass shit. Uh, but anyway, yes, visit the website. All the social media is linked to there. All the social media is linked from there. You can see pictures and sometimes uh, YouTube clips for each and every episode. And more information on some of the subjects that we cover. Again, hope you enjoyed this episode. Hope it wasn't a, hope it wasn't a complete waste of time. And I thank you so much for listening to this and every episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Please, 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 if you enjoy the show, tell your friends. And... Until we meet again, dear friends, don't be afraid. <laughs>